Hello, everyone, and welcome to this event. Uh, thank you for joining us so much. We know how busy you are trying to change the world. Not easy. And so we appreciate your time very much. Uh, my name is Nancy LaPlaca, and I want to thank my sponsors, Clean Air NC and the Sierra Club, and also friends and colleagues who helped to make this presentation possible and helped to make it much better. Um, before I start this, uh, I want to explain who I am and why I'm doing this. Um, I have spent the last 15 years on the cutting edge of energy policy, sometimes the bleeding edge. Uh, starting in 2006, I challenged a clean coal plant with carbon capture and sequestration, and that started this journey that I'm on. Uh, during this time, I've uh, been an independent intervener, an expert witness. I served as a policy advisor to a public utilities commissioner for four years. We called it the Solar Wars in Arizona. And then most recently, I created and taught three courses on clean energy and climate at App State University, where I live in Boone, North Carolina. And more importantly, why am I teaching this course? Well, what I learned starting in 2006, it drove me to learn more because honestly, I couldn't believe the, the lack of concern with issues like pollution, energy, uh, environmental justice, energy justice, hostility towards clean energy, uh, the way the system really was gamed. And the more I learned, the more I was driven to understand this world and to help others understand it as well. Uh, I've been involved in hundreds of dockets in different states, mostly Arizona, Colorado, and North Carolina. I've spent years pushing back on fossil gas, fracked gas, methane leakage, greenhouse gas accounting, power plant permits, renewable energies, and solar. And one thing that's true in this world of energy is that things come back. And lo and behold, uh, CCS, which is carbon capture and sequestration, is back. Some bad ideas take a while to die. Um, the sessions that we're going to go through, and I'm sorry, I'm on slide three here now, Kelly. Uh, th this is a summary of the sessions. So each session will be taught twice in person at 12 noon and also at 5.30 p.m., and here is a list of basically what they are. We're gonna talk about, this time we're talking about the big picture of utilities. Um, next time we'll be talking about the NCUC, the North Carolina Utilities Commission, and how that, uh, and how that affects regulatory processes. We're gonna talk about energy justice and why did it take so long? Why has it been so many decades, a hundred years before we really actually took a hard look at the inequities in the system? We're gonna look at communities on the front line. Uh, then we're gonna look at power generation. So you can understand how do you compare a coal plant with a solar farm? How do you compare natural gas with nuclear? What are the major, uh, things to understand about each type of power plant so that you can compare apples and oranges. And then finally, the last session, we're going to be talking about building a clean energy future because we are right on the cusp and all of us are change agents and there is an exciting clean energy world to come. So next slide, please. Um, please use the chat box and uh, Folks are monitoring the chat box. I'll stop about every 15 minutes to, uh, to look at questions and answer them. We want this series to work for you. So if you have feedback, please let us know. We want you to understand this and we want this to work for you and, and to make changes for the better. Uh, there's my email, laplaca.nancy at gmail.com. Please contact me anytime. Next slide, please, slide five. So think of this course as a story. And what you wanna do is get the gist of the story. There are so many details that it's best not to focus on them, but instead get the big picture. You can always find details on websites. 
This is what I tell my students when they drink from the fire hose of my classes, that I want you to, to understand really what's going on rather than details about how this type of power plant works or this type of power plant or where can I find this information. So I'm telling a story here. And, and the story is basically that we're moving from a centralized system to a decentralized system. In other words, an era of large power plants owned by monopolies to an era of smaller, more locally distributed energy that's owned by many different people. And although I'll talk a lot here about economics, it's only because that's what our current regulatory scheme demands. I will never forget many hearings that I've been in where we brought up environmental concerns and they said, you know, we don't talk about that. We're not environmental regulators. We're only economic regulators. And so as all of the frontline community people know, it's a fight just to get the system to recognize that pollution is hurting us. It's destroying our health, it's hurting our communities, and it's hurting, it's hurting all of us. Uh, clean energy provides health and jobs benefits as well as reducing climate chaos. And again, our electricity system is going through amazing changes that it has never gone through like this. And all of us are change agents, helping to change this giant system a little bit at a time. As a baby boomer, I also like to apologize to younger generations, indigenous people, people of color, and acknowledge my white privilege and, and acknowledge that I'm grateful to the Cherokee people whose land I now live on. Um, I, I am so glad that we're finally in a time where we're recognizing that pollution matters, that people matters, people matter, and that it matters way more than uh, profits. So thank you for attending, for opening yourself up to yet more sometimes painful knowledge. The purpose of this series is not to torment you, but to explain how we can move forward and create a better, fairer, healthier world that supports healthy families and healthy communities and doesn't throw people under the bus. Next, please. So the big picture on the electricity industry is that it's been around for 130 years. The first power plant was invented in the 1880s when Grover Cleveland was president. Our current regulatory model was developed in the 1920s, in the roaring 20s, when Calvin Coolidge was president. The power plants we run today were designed in the 1950s when Eisenhower was president. And they haven't really changed since. The design has not changed. The, the, uh, the, the, the power plants that we're still running today, most of them were built in the 60s when uh, Johnson and Kennedy were president. So we're talking about a system that has been around a very long time and that it really is, is ripe for change. The average US power plant is 40 years old and we have nuclear power plants with licenses to run for 80 years. So next. Um, excuse me here. So what, what's the difference between different types of utilities? We're going to mostly look at investor-owned utilities, who are the big dogs. They uh, provide 70% of the retail sales in the United States. Um, in, here in North Carolina, Duke Energy, the investor-owned utility, it either directly sells or resells somewhere between 90 and 95% of all all electricity. And so we're talking about uh, the investor-owned utilities have much more clout than, say, the rural electric co-ops. Incidentally, the rural electric co-ops are governed by federal law, and uh, that's why we really won't spend a whole lot of time of that on them. The other issue that we're going to get into here is how utilities make money, and because that's the key. How do they make money? And how is the way that they make money put them at odds with clean energy, particularly distributed energy, which means local energy in our 
communities or on our roofs? And then what are solutions? And we will have a glossary available uh, for every uh, session that's on the website. Next slide, please. So let's look at the at energy basics and and how do how do we get here? So energy basics, we basically have two types of energy, and it always irritates me that the that the Energy Information Administration, which is a part of the U.S. Department of Energy, kind of lumps them together because they they shouldn't be lumped together. They're at this point in time they're completely separate, pretty much. One is oil, and uh, it's used for transportation. And the other is electricity. And we get our electricity from coal, natural gas, fracked gas, fossil gas, nuclear power, solar, wind, hydropower, geothermal. And until recently, until the advent of electric vehicles, there really was no crossover. Cars ran on oil, uh, airplanes run on oil, uh, giant ships run on oil. And then the other fossil uh, and, and solar and wind are used for electricity. But again, with electric vehicles, that provides a point of crossover. And actually, until the late 1990s, a lot of oil was used to generate electricity. Today, it's only a small percentage because it's very, very dirty. Um, there's big changes coming soon. And I'm going to mention this a couple times because it is so important. Pretty soon, we're going to have the ability for people to use their electric vehicles as a battery to power your home. And that's a game changer because the average car battery is three times larger than one Tesla Powerwall. Okay, next here, we're on slide 10. And fossil fuels are very dense. And there are people out there who talk about how renewable energy doesn't work. It, it's, it's not true. It works very, very well. We'll see that when we go into uh, clean energy in depth in future series. But the reason they say that is because fossil fuels are so energy dense. And something that has really surprised me is that one barrel of oil equals 25,000 hours of hard human labor, which is 12 and a half years of work. Imagine if you had to push your car uphill. And so if we paid people $20 an hour for that hard labor, one barrel of oil would cost $500,000. It's, it's pretty unbelievable. But this is the one-time energy bonus that we are getting in our society, that these, that, that, coal, fossil gas, that they were uh, created over millions of years at heat and pressure. And really it's a one-time thing. Once we use it up, it's gone. The other concept I wanna talk about is called EROI. And that stands for Energy Return on Investment. And Energy Return on Investment is important because Basically, it lets you know how much energy did you use to get energy. And to explain that, I want to use the example of a very famous oil well called Spindletop. And 120 years ago, in 1901, Spindletop in Texas literally exploded with oil. The oil shot 100 feet in the air for nine days until they could camp it. And so basically we have a system where we're moving from oil literally shooting out of the ground to digging deeper and deeper holes in more and more places and doing more and more environmental damage as we dig these deeper and deeper holes. For example, we went from spindle top where the oil shot out of the ground to then we drilled on land and then we like sucked it up with a straw. And then we moved offshore to the Gulf of Mexico in the shallow areas and we drilled down there and got oil. And then when that ran out, then we moved further out into the ocean. We went 5,000 feet below the ocean surface and then 5,000 feet into the earth at the bottom of the ocean floor. That takes enormous amounts of energy and money. In fact, if you Google the 10 
most expensive energy projects in the world, you will find that they all have something to do with liquefied natural gas and basically drilling um, or compressing natural gas. And some of those projects run from 10 billion to 80 billion dollars. That's a billion with a B. So we're talking big money. And then, of course, we've never talked about externalities. And externalities, I remember when we first started talking about it around 2008 and doing filings, and people said, you can't use that word. No one knows what you're talking about. Well, right now we're living externalities. The externalities are global warming, water scarcity, horrible health effects, environmental injustice, uh, frontline communities getting hammered. Um, droughts, floods, all of the externalities that are a result from warming our climate 1.1 degrees centigrade as we've done so far. And then of course there's environmental justice issues uh, that we need to pay attention to. Next slide, please Kelly, slide 11. So this is a, a slide from one of my favorite analysts who's been an expert witness for me and is a friend. And his name is David Hughes, and his name is there in the corner. And he has done, written many, many reports on fracked gas, shale gas, liquefied natural gas, coal, and basically energy depletion. And what Dave shows in this slide that is pretty amazing is that 90% of the fossil fuels that have been used so far in our world um, have been used since the 1940s. And 50% has been used for the last, in the last 30 years. So that is a wake up call to me that we need to use our remaining fossil fuels to build the clean energy infrastructure that we need. Now, the good news is that we have great alternatives that are proven. Now, nothing is perfect, of course, but we do have solutions and alternatives, and that is what this slide uh, show is about. I'm gonna do one more slide. Kelly, this is a new one, 12 I just added, based on someone's question last time, which was a, a great question. And the question was, what is the EROI, the energy return on investment of various types of energy? And, and you can see the top dark green arrow there, it goes to oil in 1930. And then the lighter green arrow in the bottom goes to oil in the 1970s. And so you can see how the energy return on energy invested is going down over the years. Now there's a lot of debate about this and, and it's in the glossary I put some good links because some people think it doesn't matter. And there is a very healthy debate going on right now. But the bottom line is that we are in an era of declining net energy. And I believe that we need to use the energy that we have to create the energy future that we want. So are there any questions, Sally? I don't see any in the chat yet. Okay, all right, I'll keep going then. So Kelly, slide 13. So it all started in the 1880s when the first power plant was built. And actually that, you know, they spent decades just working on lighting. And then uses expanded over the decades. The first power plant was built in New York. And as you can see from that photo there, see all those power lines going every which way? That's because as different people built different power plants, they built their own transmission lines. So this was very dangerous. It was, you know, duplicative, it was expensive. And so we needed a system so that we wouldn't have like, you know, 10 different power lines. And over a series of decades, that is when our regulatory system started. Um, back in the 20s and 30s, there were actually accidents where people were electrocuted and horses were electrocuted because of all these power lines going all over the place. Now, there's a great movie if you want to uh, watch something about the, this, this era. It's called The War of the Currents. And it's a very, it's a great movie. I really enjoyed it. And it's about AC versus DC power 
and Tesla versus Westinghouse. And one of the reasons why I want to highlight AC versus DC power is because this is a, this is a situation that's also going to be important in the world to come, in our energy world to come. And that is because in the power lines in the power lines in my house, it's AC power. But my computer that I'm sitting at right now runs on DC. And so that thing that I plug into the wall to keep the, the my computer going, it converts the AC power that I get from the grid to DC power to run my appliance. And so we're going to see a world of appliances where we're going to probably see uh, appliances that run directly on DC power. The other big thing that happened between the 1930s and the 1960s is that larger turbines were built, larger power plants, and that meant economies of scale. And so what the electricity industry did very smartly is as customers used more electricity, they lowered the price and they were able to lower the price because as the generators, the power plants got bigger and bigger, it cost less to produce electricity. In fact, in the 1960s, many utilities were still selling appliances like washing machines and ovens and things like that. The other thing I want to mention about the 1930s is that the Great Depression really affected electric utilities as many went bankrupt. Why? It's because people like Edison's protege, Samuel Insull, who's quite an interesting character, he was at one point in time one of the most powerful and rich people in the country politically and cash-wise. And it's because he had a house of cards of holding companies that owned dozens and dozens of utilities. And as all that debt got deleveraged, the whole house of cards collapsed in the 1930s. And in fact, FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, he made the electric utility industry the poster child for bad behavior. And if you look at the game Monopoly, the guy in the middle with his hat, that is Samuel Insull, because while Samuel Insull was incredibly famous and rich and powerful, once the electric utilities crashed, he moved and died in Paris. And he wasn't penniless, but he was definitely not well liked. The other thing that happened in the 1930s is the Rural Electrification Act, which really matters in places like rural America, which is where I live. And that's because uh, the reason that they passed the Rural Electrification Act was because utilities couldn't afford to string that much transmission lines for so few customers. And so the Rural Electrification Act invested money in rural electric co-ops. And that is why co-ops are governed by the federal government and not by state public utilities commissions or PUCs. So next slide here, Kelly, slide 14. And I want most people don't realize that there's a giant infrastructure of transporting fossil fuels. I'm sure all the pipeline people on this call know this, but many people are unaware of it. And, and this is a map of coal by rail. And I want you to notice there that, that kind of orange yellow uh, sort of blob amoeba shape there up in uh, Wyoming and, uh, Montana, and that is the Powder River Basin. And about 45% of the country's coal comes from there. Now, one of the interesting things about shipping coal is that you notice that Florida, coal is not shipped there to Florida. And that's because in places like Florida, the coal comes from South America on a barge because it's so much cheaper to take coal and stick it on a barge and float it up than it is to, to transport it by rail. Also, please look at in Georgia, there's a dot right there in Georgia. And that is a very famous coal plant called Plant Sharer because Jeff Goodell, who wrote a book called Big Coal, did a whole section on Plant Sharer. It's one of the oldest, dirtiest coal plants in the country. And by the time they shipped that coal from the Powder River Basin all the way to Georgia, 80% of the total cost is transportation. So we have a system 
that has largely been under the radar where you've got, you know, you've got pipelines and, and barges and railroad cars and um, this whole system that, that moves these fossil fuels around the country. At one point in time, coal accounted for 40% of all train cargo by weight. That's way down now. But um, I know there was a period of time there where the only information we could get about coal transportation was when the railroad industry sued the coal companies. And so we got a lot of information by reading those lawsuits. So next, please, Kelly, slide 15. This is a map of fossil gas pipelines that I'm sure many of you know. And you can see all those pipelines in the Gulf Coast. And so traditionally in our country, natural gas has moved north and west. But what's been happening with fracking, because fracking is happening mostly in the northwest and also Colorado and New Mexico, is that gas is all of a sudden moving north to south, or they would like it to move from north to south and from west to east. And so there's been an explosion of pipelines getting built, as I'm sure many of you on this call already know. Um, Land-based fracking started growing around 2006 and grew very, very quickly. And one of the things that was remarkable about it was that the Bush administration, Bush younger, Bush too, and Dick Cheney, they set things up so that fracking escaped review. It was exempt from the Clean Air Act. It was exempt from the Clean Water Act. It was exempt from EPA regulations. And so basically that is why fracking has been, was under the radar for so long and why it took such a long time to get any data on the pollution effects of fracking. Now, as we're, we, we saw in this most recent hurricane, Ida, Hurricanes Katrina, Ida, and others have heavily damaged oil platforms in the Gulf. And as we get more and more hurricanes, that's just going to happen more and more. Later on in future sessions, we're going to dive deeper into fracking and into, you know, what I consider a pipe dream, frankly, to export U.S. natural gas in the form of liquefied natural gas or LNG. Okay, so let's move now, next slides, Kelly, slide 16, to uh, this diagram, it's called a sand key diagram. And let's first look at the green. So the green is petroleum. And we use this petroleum for our cars and trucks and stuff, right? Cars, however, are incredibly inefficient. So if you follow this green line, you'll see that there's only a very skinny dark gray line and a very, very wide light gray line. That light gray line is wasted fuel and pollution. Why? Because internal combustion engine cars are 80% inefficient. In other words, only 20% of the gasoline that you put in your car actually moves the car. 80% of it is lost as heat and pollution. It's pretty astounding. Whereas electric vehicles, even though they have their problems, I do not want to minimize the human rights issues or the mining issues at all, but electric vehicles are 95% efficient. So what that means is 95% of the kilowatt hours that I put into my electric vehicle, my 2017 LEAF, that directly turns to energy that moves the car. The other reason why electric vehicles are really gonna take off is because they really have very few moving parts. Whereas I believe an internal combustion engine car has 2000 moving parts and it needs oil and oil changes and things break down. So with electric vehicles, your maintenance costs are much, much lower and your efficiency, the amount of uh, the, the efficiency of turning the fuel into movement is much, much better. Again, only 20% with oil, cars, internal combustion engine, and 95% efficient with electric vehicles. So next slide here, Kelly, slide 17. And then there's other losses that are kind of amazing. 
Um, Amory Levins, who's a very famous energy uh, expert and has been for 50 years, really. He did a study in 2005 that was published in Scientific American. And it, it, I, I, it came out right as I started this work. And I remember just being stunned. And his study found that when you accounted for all of the losses, not just the two thirds of energy lost in converting the fuel to electricity, but also the transmission line losses, the distribution losses, the losses in your house, turning that electricity into a light from a light bulb, that only 2% of the original energy from the coal is actually fuels does work. It's pretty amazing. There's a lot of energy that goes into washing coal and, and sort of prepping coal to be ready to be burned. And so this is why distributed generation makes so much sense because we spend so much money on infrastructure, hauling around fuels, which generates a lot of heat and a lot of pollution and a lot of damage. So next slide, please, Kelly, slide 18. And this is a challenging, these are challenging concepts. So I'm just gonna go over these and it's, it can be very confusing. Um, and anybody who does energy work, I'm sure they'll tell you that it took them a while to, to get it also. So when we talk about electricity, the challenging thing about it is that it moves in time. So you've got an amount, a capacity of energy, which is a kilowatt. And then you've got a flow of energy, which is electricity, which is a kilowatt hour. Now, a kilowatt, I think of it as a bucket. It is a, it is an, a total amount of energy. How big is the bucket? The bucket is the same size, whether it's running or not. The hose, however, is, is the hose on high? Is it on low? How big is the hose? Is it, is it giant? Is it little? And that tells us the quantity, how much energy are we getting? And if you're gonna look at power plants and understand power plants, the first thing you wanna know is how much electricity is it gonna generate? Is it gonna run 100% of the time, 2% of the time? Because there's a big, big difference. Because whether or not that power plant is cost effective is very much affected by how much electricity it generates and when it generates that electricity also. Um, so next slide here is energy and capacity. And I don't know if you guys have ever looked at your light bulbs, but when you look at your light bulb, you see, oh, I just bought a, a, a 60 watt light bulb. But for, for the purpose of ease, let's just say it's a 100 watt light bulb. If you have a 100 watt light bulb and you run it for 10 hours, you just used a kilowatt hour. So literally a thousand watts. Now, the important thing to understand about this is that these, these are, this is relative. If you look at your energy bill at your house, it's going to tell you how much energy you used in kilowatt, kilowatt hours. But if you go to Walmart, Walmart is so big that they look at their energy use in megawatt hours. And they, they're, they're a whole different, you know, order of magnitude. And let's look at the next slide, Kelly, that's slide 20, to talk about energy and capacity again. So if you look at the left here, we've got three kinds of power plants, a nuclear plant, an onshore wind plant and a solar plant, solar PV with a tracker. The tracker just means that it follows the sun. And when it follows the sun, it can make more electricity. So the size of each one of those power plants in our theoretical, you know, just for purposes of this, uh, this uh, example are the same. We have a hundred megawatt nuclear plant, a hundred megawatt onshore wind and a hundred megawatts of solar with the tracker. Now, the energy, another name for energy is the capacity factor. And all that means is what percentage of the hours in a year is it going to run? So again, imagine that you own this power plant. What you're going to want to know is 
How many hours a year is it going to run? Is it going to run all the time? Hardly at all? Is it going to break down all the time like clean coal does? So you see that our nuclear plant runs 93% of the time. That is the average for the and a nuclear power plant in the United States. They run all the time. How about wind, onshore wind? Well, it's gotten better and now it's closer. It used to be about 30%, now it's 40%. So that means that of that 100 megawatt wind plant, we can expect it to generate electricity about 40% of the hours in a year. Now, what about solar? Well, if it's just flat plate and it doesn't track the sun, then it's gonna get less than if we have a tracker and we follow the sun. So in North Carolina, that's about 20, 25%. So this is why it's confusing and difficult to understand power plants because each type of power plant has its own characteristics and how much it runs and when it runs and what are the externalities are, are key. So next slide, please, Kelly, slide 21. So energy users have a huge impact as well. And let's just think of these guys in terms of small, medium, and large. Small, residential house. We don't use that much energy. And then medium, a hair salon, you know, a, a downtown business. It uses way more than my house, but it's really not that much energy. It's a, it's a small or medium uh, business. And then we've got large, like a grocery store. Think of all the energy that a grocery store uses, all of those coolers and all the lights and everything that runs the grocery store. It's a large energy users. But the, the energy users that are changing the market right now are the extra large energy users. Facebook, data centers, Google, hospitals, Walmarts. And here's why. And here's why this is really changing the market in very profound ways. Around 2012, if Walmart or a data center wanted clean energy, they would go to the incumbent utility in a state like North Carolina, which is Duke Energy, and they'd say, hey, Duke, we want clean energy. And so Duke would say, okay, you have to pay three cents extra. And so they would, they'd pay extra so that they could tell their customers that they use clean energy because their customers are demanding clean energy. However, as the cost of clean energy declined over the years, Walmart and all these other large energy users said to themselves, hey, why are we going through Duke? Why don't we just do it ourselves and basically act as their own utility? And they purchased power directly on the wholesale market from solar or wind farms. Now, wholesale versus retail is a level of complexity I'm not gonna get into right here. But understand that these large energy users are changing the market in profound ways. Let me give you one more example. Around five or six years ago in Nevada, a whole bunch of casinos wanted clean energy because their customers are demanding it. And so they went to the, the, these casinos, huge energy users, they went to the Utilities Commission in Nevada and they said, hey, we want to buy our own clean energy. And so what happened was the incumbent utility in Nevada, which was uh, Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway, mostly coal, they said, okay, we'll let you off the hook, but you have to pay us between 20 and $80 million. And that's what they paid. Each of these casinos paid somewhere between 20 and $80 million to exit the contract. And then what they did was they just contracted with a solar developer and the solar developer put up solar in Nevada and they bought it directly from them. So this is a huge, huge game changer. Um, Sally, I'm gonna stop here now. Do any more, qu any questions? Yes, there are a couple, let's see here. Okay. Um, George asks, it seems like the kilowatt and kilowatt hour analogy is backwards. Kilowatts is a unit of rate, which seems to be what you described with the hose. Can you clarify that? Yes. Well, you know, to be honest, it, it, it kind of, it, it is a confusing metaphor. Um, and so let's, let's, can we talk offline, George? Is this George Santucci by any chance? George Perkins. 
okay, George, I'd love it if you could contact me and let's talk about that because honestly, I have gone back and forth. And to me, the bucket is capacity. It doesn't change. The hose is what changes. So <clears throat> I, I apologize for that imperfect analogy. It might be, so he says kilowatt is a unit of rate. Would you say that was the case or would you say that kilowatt hours is a unit of rate? Well, I would say that it's, I would say that it's confusing and let's take it offline at okay. some point, okay. Um, okay, another question, does onshore, this is from Lois, does onshore wind have a 40% energy capacity specifically in North Carolina? And does that mean that's how long the wind blows enough here? Yes, that, that's a good question. You know, we have a ridge law that prevents us from putting up a lot of uh, wind, but we do have 200 megawatts up in Pasquotank. I hope I'm saying that right. And up in that county that's up in the very, very northeast most county of North Carolina, there's a 200 megawatt wind farm that's owned by, I believe it's Amazon. And so I would have to check on the capacity factor of that. And Lois, um, I'd be happy to show you where I got that data from Lawrence Berkeley Labs, because what these uh, US Department of Energy Labs do every year, very helpfully, is they go through utility scale solar, onshore wind, offshore wind, distributed solar. And every year they give us a report and they show us like in the Southeast, what's the capacity factor? In other words, how much does the wind blow in the Southeast versus let's say Iowa where it blows all the time or Colorado where it blows all the time. So the resource quality, like how much wind, how much electricity can you get? It varies by location. And I hope I've answered that question, but please reach out. So your 40% is an average for the whole country? Yes. Okay. Um, Weston asks, can you clarify the point about the big energy users changing the market? Yes. So here's why they changed the market. Because it used to be, you know, 2012, that because of, because North Carolina is a regulated state and most, many states are regulated, only the incumbent provider could generate and sell electricity. But that was because it was the, it's, that's the retail market. When you're talking about the wholesale market, the wholesale market is a different animal. And let me just compare this to like shopping in a clothing store, okay? If you pay retail, you're gonna pay full price. I'm a retail electricity customer. I pay my utility retail rates. But when one utility sells to another, or when one big energy user sells to another big energy, ener you know, big energy generator sells to a big energy user, you get a discount. And the discount is called the wholesale rate. Now, when these large energy users all over the country started going directly to the wholesale market, they actually have to go to FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, and get permission but when they started doing that, it really changed the market because let's just take a hypothetical utility. And let's just say that 3% of that utility sale went to Walmart and uh, Costco and Target. And all of a sudden Walmart, Costco and Target went and built their own clean energy. Well, they just lost a whole lot of sales and that is really gonna affect them because when you, you, when you uh, lose just a little bit of sales, you can lose a lot of profit, which we're gonna get into. So I hope I've explained that. Uh, we have another question. Um, in Nevada, when the casinos went, went rogue, how did they provide electricity in the evening when they were- Well, they, um, you know, that's a good question. Um, I'm not sure if they had batteries or they had some kind of backup. They probably bought power on the open market because there is a wholesale market for electricity. And so you're gonna buy your uh, grid power at night. Oh. You want another question? Sure. 
Um, Laura asks, um, I, she says she recently received a letter from Duke saying she can buy blocks of renewable energy. Should she be suspicious of this? Well, you know, I think it's something that you have to look at and maybe talk to some other people too, because, you know, you're encouraging Duke Energy to do clean energy, and that's good. However, we're also in this, in this state of North Carolina, we have a pitifully small amount of distributed generation. So in other words, even though we have a lot of large scale solar, we have very, very few solar roofs. So let me give you an example. In this country right now, we have 327 million people. So let's just, let me just do a guess and say we have 100 million buildings. And we have about 3 million solar roofs, 3 million. That's not very many. Consider Australia. They have about 25 million people and they also have close to 3 million solar roofs. So they have way, way, way more distributed generation. So I would say there's a push pull and the push and, and, the, and, and one of them is you're encouraging Duke Energy. But the other is that I believe that the utilities do not like distributed generation. And so we need to have policies that are going to encourage distributed generation. And so in that sense, um, I think it is good to, to put up your own solar. And right now in Duke territory, those rules are good. However, if I had to give an answer, I'd say do it because let's encourage the utilities to do clean energy. Any more questions, Sally? That, that is the last question. I'll just note that there are some uh, others in the chat who think that it's not a good idea. Okay, and I, I totally respect that. I think it's push-pull. Let me give you one example. And Kelly, slide 22, please. My utility, New River Light and Power, after much haranguing from me, finally decided to buy hydro. So they are buying hydro from Brookfield uh, renewables, which is a private company, and they, it comes from Eastern Tennessee. Well, they're charging me. Um, if I want to cover all of my electricity use, I'd have to pay about probably about ten or fifteen dollars a month extra. However, what I really want is rules so that I can put solar up on my roof and it makes sense. I don't really want hydropower from Eastern Tennessee. I want solar and I want it locally and I want it on my roof. And so I'm going to be stubborn and I'm not going to buy that. So, you know, I respect people who think that that's maybe not a good idea, but, you know, there's a lot of push pull here and there's a lot of room for people to have different viewpoints on that. Okay, so let me, let me move on here to a real uh, market maker. And we're on slide 22 here creating value in America's economy. This is from the Edison Electric Institute or EEI. They are incredibly powerful and they are a trade group. So they're not a utility. They're a trade group that represents utilities, one type of utility, and that is investor owned utilities, the highest profit type of utility. So EEI represents about 90% of all the investor-owned utilities in the United States, and they account for about 70% of total electricity sales in the U.S. So you're talking a big player. And a, every year they do a, uh, a statement to Wall Street. It's, it's there. The link is there on the bottom of the slide. And they say, hey, Wall Street, here's what we're up to. Here's how much money we spend. Here's what we're doing. You know, a lot of it's PR, frankly, but there's some good information in there. And one of the pieces of information that really is amazing to me is that, is that the electric utility industry accounts for almost a trillion dollars of U.S. gross domestic product. So we have an economy in this country of about $21 trillion. And the value of the U.S. electricity system is about $900 billion. It wouldn't surprise me if it was over a trillion if you started pulling in other things and really, really, you know, took a look at it. Are we counting all the coal, all the natural gas, fossil gas, fracked gas, the, uh, you know, the, the, the guys who do energy procurement and drilling, et cetera? 
So you're talking about an industry that is profoundly, profoundly powerful. And you're talking also about a, a world, this regulatory world that's full of jargon. And the jargon really keeps people out. And so one of the purposes of this class and uh, my personally is to explain these concepts in plain language. That is our purpose. Because what do we want in a democracy that functions well? We want transparency, we want process, and we want to know what's going on. We want easier access to relevant information presented clearly so that normal people can participate meaningfully. Because the lack of understanding, the lack of transparency, and the lack of discussion needs to change and must change. And that's why everyone is on this call. So um, the utilities spend a lot of money uh, to keep their natural monopoly. And, and let's talk a little bit here about why they have a monopoly. They have a monopoly because back in the 1920s and 30s, when you saw that picture with all those power lines everywhere, it made sense to allow one utility to operate in one geographic footprint. It's called the utilities footprint because it's their, it's their area, it's their map. And most, in most places, most regulated states, only one utility is allowed to sell energy at retail rate, on the retail level, not wholesale, but retail. So what do we get in exchange for these utilities like Duke Energy getting to be a monopoly? Well, we're supposed to get, uh, we're supposed to be pr get protected. We're supposed to be, uh, we're supposed to get clean, cheap energy. We're supposed to, we're supposed to have regulators that make sure that our utilities are acting in our best interest and not just their best interest. And the reason why we're going to do a deep dive in the NCUC, the North Carolina Utilities Commission, is because they are the guys who decide who gets paid. So it's the old, uh, what's that uh, movie? Show me the money. Show me the money. That is what the NCUC does. They are the guys who stamp it and say, okay, Duke, now you can charge all the rate payers, all the customers. And that's what we're going to talk about is that whole system and the processes within that system and how they need to change. Now, the legislature also plays a role. We're going to get into that in the renewable portfolio standard part. But for now, let's just, I'm, I'm going to not go into detail on the legislative role. Um, and although there are a few types of state oversight, regulated versus deregulated, we're going to focus on North Carolina, which is a regulated state. Now, the next slide here, 23. This is a slide that shows how much money the electric utility industry spends. And what caught my eye when I looked through this uh, report to Wall Street, which the link is there, is that over the last 10 years, they have doubled their capital expenditures. And as my students ask, what's a capital expenditure? That is what you spend on a giant building, on a power plant, on a substation, on a transmission line. S not people costs, not labor costs, not pass-throughs, but giant capital expenditures, a nuclear power plant, a gas plant, a pipeline, substations. That is what the utility makes a 10% rate of return on. And that is why they like big, expensive infrastructure. Because do they want to make 10% rate of return on 100 million? Or do they want to make a 10% rate of return on 10 billion? And nuclear power plants right now are coming in at $30 billion, which is pretty staggering. Anyway, the other, the other thing is that utilities suffer greatly if they lose a little bit of sales. In fact, a friend of mine who's an expert described this once as baking a cake. So when the utility, you think of, a, of utility uh, sales as baking a cake, they bake the cake, they layer the cake, you know, it's a big giant cake, but they don't get money. 
They don't really make a profit unless they get to put the frosting on the cake. And that's why they love hot summers. That's why they like when everybody cranks up the air conditioning and buys more electricity. Um, and that is when they make money because their fixed costs are very high. They have to pay for the power plant and the transmission lines and the substation. Then they have a lot of safety costs and people costs. So if they lose a little bit of sales, they can lose a lot of profits. Okay, next slide here. We're at 24. And this is what the US energy mix is right now. And, and this is what needs to change. Uh, the amount of change that we've had in the last 10 years is really pathetic, honestly. It's sad. It should be way better than this. So look on the left, the 2010 resource mix nationally. This is not North Carolina. This is the U.S. And so you see the coal's about 45%. Well, just a few years before that, it was 50%. And you see that natural gas is about 23%. Well, look at 2020. Coal has shrunk dramatically. But look how much natural gas has grown. And so the combination of natural gas and coal is about the same. It's about the same. And the problem is that natural gas is worse for the climate than coal. And, and if I could explain this simply, it's because methane, which is natural gas or fossil gas or fracked gas, is more reactive. And so it creates more heat. Now, we've known this since 2014, when the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change told us that methane, which is, again, fossil gas, was extremely reactive and doing a lot of damage to the climate. But really, it took us until now to get attention on this. So many, many people have been talking about this for a long time. But thank heaven, we're finally starting to talk about this. So solar doesn't even show up on this chart but it's about 3% of total US electricity right now. In fact, let me, let me contrast this with Germany, which we're gonna go into in more depth in the, generation, uh, in the generation part. And that is that in Germany, 60% of the energy resources, of the clean energy resources, wind, solar, geothermal, are owned by individuals and small businesses. Let me say that again, 60% of the clean energy resources are owned by small businesses and individuals. In our country, it's such a tiny, tiny percentage that if I drew a part chart and tried to show you, you couldn't even see that little tiny slice. So that really is, is the gist of it. It's that in this country, we are not allowed to buy the clean energy that we're want, we want. We're not allowed to. Whereas in Germany, anyone can buy and anyone can sell. Anybody. You can get together with your neighbors. Hey, Joe, let's use your backyard. It's really great for solar. Yeah, let's put up a, let's put up a megawatt and we could all use it, the five of us. Yeah, sure. Let's all throw in our money. That's how it goes in Germany. Not here. In fact, Germany based their law, which is called the Energiewende, that passed in 1999 on a U.S. law called PERPA the Public Utility Regulatory Policy Act that attempted to crack open the market. The other thing I want to mention here is hydropower. And hydropower, I'm sure you've been reading the news lately, it's going up, down, up, down, up, down. And in Arizona, where I lived for 27 years and worked on energy policy, Lake Mead, which is the largest reservoir in the United States, is as low as it's been since it was first filled in the 1930s. And there's going to come a point where it's called Deadpool, where the lake level is so low that it's below the intake. So no water, no Colorado River go, water goes to Phoenix or Tucson or to San Diego or to grow vegetables. Uh, and furthermore, you don't have any power, hydropower, because the water's too low. So we're at a time where really it's pretty shocking. If you look at the hydropower capacity factors. If you look at California right now today, what is the difference between how much hydropower was generated this year versus five years ago? It's staggering because all of those hydropower stations, 
I, I can think of Lake Oroville way, way down. And frankly, this is going to be a game changer in our world because the Colorado River, which fills Lake Mead and Lake Powell, and which runs the 2000 megawatt hydropower dam at Hoover Dam, we could lose it. And that means the 25 million people downstream will not have that water. And that is a crisis for sure. So Duke Energy, Duke Energy mix um, uh, in, in 2020 was about 40% gas, 37% nuclear, 22% coal, and 2% renewable, but that, that is Duke Energy in all the six states. So if you're looking at Duke Energy just in North Carolina, some of it's the same. It's about 40% gas. It's about 30% nuclear, about 30% coal, and about 5 or 6% solar. So that's also what's confusing about, about energy is that when you, have a, when you have a utility like Duke Energy, well, they're in six states and they have, you know, they have all of these different subsidiaries. They, I think they used to have like 10 and now they're down to maybe seven, but it takes some work to understand how to parse that all out. Okay, next slide, please, Kelly. And that is slide 25. So here's the utility ecosystem, okay? The hard assets are the power plants. The soft assets are the people and the chemicals and the fuel. Oversight is a huge question. And that's what we're going to get into in the next session. But And what I want people to realize is that fuel, which is frack gas, coal, nuclear fuel, those are pass-through costs. In other words, they just get passed through directly to the customers. The utility doesn't make a, a profit on it. And so they don't really care so much what that cost is. In 2008, when I was working in Colorado and we were pushing for more energy efficiency in solar over natural gas, and we were pushing against fracking, basically what we saw in that time frame that summer when oil hit $147 a barrel, is that when I started in that docket, it must have been around January of 2008, the cost of natural gas was like six bucks a million BTU. And by June, when we had the hearing, it was $13 a million BTU. So, the, so natural gas costs have gone up, down, up, down. This week, they're up hugely because um, because of the because of Hurricane Ida and other other reasons, um, and and oversight is incredibly important. And um, I want to talk about that in the next slide here, which is slide twenty six. And this this is very recently happened. And that is, I love this headline: South Carolina spent nine billion dollars to dig a hole in the ground and then fill it back in. And that's almost unbelievable, but that's what happened. And when I would teach this at App State, my students wouldn't believe it. So I would have to Google it and show them the newspaper clippings. But basically what happened was they spent $9 billion on a power plant that will never run and never produce electricity. And South Carolina utility customers, and I have a number of friends down there, depending on the utility, are literally paying $8 to $27 a month right now for this power plant that will never run. And there's a giant fight about who's gonna have to pay for what. Now, there are a couple of states that, that, that did this. South Carolina's one, Georgia's one, and Florida's one. And North Carolina had a boondoggle, but it was only a half a billion dollars. So why was North, South Carolina's boondoggle $9 billion nuclear debacle, but ours was only a half a billion? Florida's was about three or four billion, and Georgia right now is about, they're at 30 billion and counting. So why was our nuclear uh, failure only 500 million? And that's because of oversight. Because the law that was passed in South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida basically gave unlimited spending authority to the utilities and no oversight. And so by the time they raised their hands and said, whoops, sorry, 
we just spent that $9 billion and uh, it doesn't work. Well, that's be, there's no oversight. And in fact, if you look that up, if you look up what happened to the VC summer plant, people are going to jail. Westinghouse went bankrupt over this one. Um, and uh, quite a few, last I checked, four people were going to jail for fraud and basically for lying to regulators and saying, oh, it's fine, everything's going to be okay. But it wasn't. Now, North Carolina, due to the efforts of advocates, said, okay, you can spend money on this nuclear plant, but we have to have oversight. We need a hearing. We need an evidentiary hearing. And we want the ability to go in and ask people questions. Because when we have transparency and we have process, we don't have these boondoggles. Next slide, please, 27. Okay, this one is titled Scandals Work. Nuclear fiasco equals PUC reform. I love this headline. It's just from two days ago. Reforms from the VC summer nuclear fiasco are pushing South Carolina towards clean energy. Why? Because when you have a fiasco, people pay attention. And I have to say that, you know, in this work that I have done, I can't believe the billions that go by. Billions and billions, billions spent on fuel, billions spent on, on, uh, on you know, uh, uh, pollution control devices that cost 10 times more than the original power plant. 10 times. That's normal. And so this is an area that needs a lot more scrutiny. So next slide, please, Kelly, 28. And we're going to do a deeper dive into Duke Energy, but it is one of the most powerful utilities in the U.S. and the world. They're also multinational. And one of the things that was kind of interesting to note was that in 2016, Duke Energy sold a giant hydropower plant to China for $1.2 billion, and the link is in the, the speaker notes. In 2021, Brazil's drought was so bad that hydropower generation was down by 91%. 91%. So Duke Energy sold that hydropower plant to China just in time. I would say that was pretty good timing. They could have had an asset that was worth nothing, or they sold it to China in 2016 for $1.2 billion. They are also an enormously popular powerful political player. And really the amount of money that they're spending is ramping up and up and up. And that's because they're getting more attention. They're getting more pesky interveners, more pesky advocates showing up, people asking hard questions. So next slide here, slide 29. And this is from Follow the Money. And Duke Energy spent $25.3 million dollars on about 3,000 different filers. Now, what's a filer? Kathy asked me, Kathy Buckley, good question. A filer, it can be a candidate for public office, like somebody running for the state legislature or for Congress, or even a town council or a city council, or it can be a group like Consumers for Smart Solar, which actually worked against solar that was funded by utilities, including Duke Energy. Pat McCrory, who was North Carolina governor from 2012 to 2016, was a high-level Duke Energy employee for 29 years. That's 29 years. And now he's running for the U.S. Senate. Former Duke Energy North Carolina President Paul Newton is now a state senator at the North Carolina General Assembly. And so, you know, he's very influential. And he, he may, I wrote a blog post once about him where he was saying, oh, I'm going to give back to my community because state legislators make very little money, $20,000, $25,000. But of course, this is after he made millions and millions of dollars over you know, decades with Duke Energy. So we have these investor-owned utilities in every single state. They are one of the highest spending industries, whether it's the state level or the federal level. You show me a state and I'll show a utility that, that tried to pull the strings. Arizona is a great example. In 2014, I thought about running as a public utility commissioner in Arizona because it's an elected state. Public utilities commissioners are elected. That election cycle, Arizona Public Service Company spent $11 million to get rid of the Democrat 
uh, candidate. It wasn't me. I, I withdrew. But they spent $11 million to elect friendly regulators. These are positions that pay $80,000 a year in Arizona, and they spent $11 million dollars. And it took years for this information to come out, years and years and lawsuits. So it's not easy to find. And there, it, it's not just that they give money and that they pull the political strings. It's also former North Carolina Utilities Commissioner Chair Ed Finley spent decades as a utility attorney. The current executive director, he also worked as an attorney for the utility industry and oil and gas law firm. So unfortunately, the revolving door is common. And uh, um, it's, it, that needs to change too. So next slide, please. Um, this is one of my favorite headlines of all time. This is David Roberts, who's a master storyteller about utilities and energy. And at the time he was working for Grist and what a great headline, solar panels could destroy US utilities according to US utilities. And this was a report that that EEI put out actually, and I'm sure they regretted it and they didn't let their PR people really go through it with a fine tooth comb because basically what they said in this study is that the solar industry is gonna eat your lunch and the cost of solar is gonna come down, 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 down and people are gonna want more and more distributed energy closer to load. And so you're gonna, you're gonna peel off sales. You're gonna peel it off. And so these guys are gonna eat your lunch and so you better kill them now. Another interesting story about that, the state of Kansas, there were like seven people who put solar on their roofs, like literally seven people in the entire state. So what did the electric utility do? They ran to the state legislature and they basically killed rooftop solar. So we have an industry that is really working overtime. This is not hyperbole to, to kill distributed solar. The time for change has arrived. The utility business model has been the same for a hundred years and it consistently, it doesn't just shut out clean energy. It shuts out, it, it, it hurts people. It really hurts people. And, and that's one thing that I love about working with the young, younger generation and, and, and so many advocates is that we're not gonna throw people under the bus, is that the clean energy revolution cannot throw people under the bus. So. Next slide, please, Kelly, slide 31. Um, I'm gonna, again, I'm gonna just go through IOUs throughout this uh, six sessions. And I wanna mention again that rural electric co-ops have federal oversight. But really the big question is this, who has power over who? Who has power, who benefits and who pays? And what does it mean to be regulated? Does it mean that they just look, you just look the other way and say, oh no, we don't need any hearings. Oh no, go ahead and do what you want. Build, spend $9 billion on that nuclear plant that never won, that's okay. Or do we want regulators that actually regulate and work in our best interests? And again, I'll say this a number of times, what we want is transparency and process. That is what we need in democracy at all levels, whether we're talking about healthcare or electricity. We want, we want process and we want transparency. Um, let's see here. Um, I'm gonna end here with, uh, this is a map of, uh, of, of North Carolina. The stripes are Duke Energy. The uh, green is rural electric co-ops. The black dots are municipal electric utilities. Um, and we'll go do a deeper dive into that um, when we go into uh, North Carolina and Duke. And then solutions here, I wanna show you, whoops, sorry, Kelly, I'm up at slide 33. Okay, sorry about that. Skip through 32, 33, and now 34. We want a system that works for us. This is what we need. We want to make sure that people matter and not just utility process. And then the next slide, Kelly, which is 35. And this is from uh, Mark Jacobson. I'm sorry, folks, I'm going to go over here just a little bit. But Professor Mark Jacobson from Stanford has done one of these for every state in the country. 
And basically, if you look at this, you see that we have huge potential for offshore wind. He says 50%. And the reason is because our continental shelf is so gradual that you can put wind turbines out there and so that you, they're not an eyesore, but you don't have to go so far through the water to ground the wind turbine. There's lots of other kinds of wind turbines that are being studied too, like floating wind turbines. And it's a very exciting area right now, offshore wind. Um, we have some potential for onshore wind, especially in Western North Carolina where I live. And if you look at solar PV rooftop and large scale, it's about 30%. And in fact, I would ask Mark Jacobson, maybe that number might have changed as the cost of solar has come down. And really what we're looking for is freedom of choice. Polluter pays. We want what comes with clean energy, which is we address climate change, we get jobs, we quit dumping pollution on our poorest and most vulnerable people. Next slide, please, Kelly, that's slide 36. And this is various people in North Carolina out there uh, working for change. Folks are showing up, and this is what I've seen in my career. When I first showed up at the Colorado Public Utilities Commission, my friend and I were like one, you know, there was like two of us talking about the environment, me and her. And by the time I quit working in Colorado, which was about probably about 2010, there were 40 parties showing up. And I bet now they have 80 parties in Colorado. So more and more people are showing up. And, and if you're not going to show up, which is fine, it's difficult, help groups that are showing up there and that are pushing the North Carolina utilities. Governor Cooper appoints those commissioners. And so we have a say. Our frontline communities, our youth, our activists, our landowners, our homeowners, we're demanding change and change is going to happen because the electricity system is going through the biggest changes it's gone through since its inception and people are tired of dirty energy. So let's go to the final slide here, Kelly, that's number 37. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, thank you to the Sierra Club. Thank you to Clean Air NC. For, for hosting this and for all your help with your great, uh, your great staff people. Um, I'm so appreciative. Um, thank you very much. And we'll open it up to questions. Should uh, we stop this share here? Hmm. Oh, Nancy, there's an interesting one here. Uh, do any electrical utilities own distributed generation? Yes, some of them do. And there's been experiments around the country. Um, in Arizona, Tucson Electric Power and Arizona Public Service Company both had experiments where they, they, uh, they wanted to own distributed generation. They would rent people's rooftops for $30. So uh, utilities are owning some distributed generation, but really the business model that utilities have is utility scale. And there is val validity to the argument that utility scale clean energy solar is cheaper. It's cheaper to put solar on a Walmart, which is equivalent to 200 homes, than to put it on 200 homes. However, there are more and more studies that show the value of distributed generation and it's resilience. It's being able to beat the peak. It's when we have heat waves that I'm not using electricity. And so all my neighbors who don't have solar, they can pull on the grid. So, you know, let's reduce the, the uh, let's reduce the, uh, you know, pull on the grid. Mm -hmm. um, then there's a question, which in your opinion, which fuel is worse, oil or natural gas? Well, they're all pretty bad, really. I mean, that's they're pretty bad. I mean, you know, the interesting thing about fracking, honestly, is that I remember I used to have this T-shirt called, it said WTF on it, Why the Fabers? And basically it was about, it was a group, I think it might've been Oil Change International, that had tracked that the fracking industry basically very quietly before fracking happened, this is in 05, the Energy Policy Act of 2005, they exempted themselves from the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, and any EPA oversight. And so fracking just ran rampant. It just ran free for a long time. 
Oil is <clears throat> less and less a part of the electric utility industry. But if you look at Duke Energy's power plants and you, you'll see that they are burning oil. There are some power plants that are burning oil. And that is a very, very, very dirty way to make energy. We should not be burning oil. Nancy, there was one question about the South Carolina example. <clears throat> will that plant ever, was it Vogel? Will it ever operate? Why did it not work? Okay, so the VC summer plant was never built. The VC summer plant is in South Carolina. It was never built. That's the giant hole in the ground. <clears throat> the Vogel plant, and I hope I'm saying this right, it's V-O-G-T-L-E, is in Georgia. And what they're doing there is they're adding another 2,200 megawatts into the existing Vogel power plant. And that is what is costing $30 billion. So the jury's out right now on the Vogel plant. If you Google it, you'll see that they just asked for like another couple billion dollars. But it, we don't know what's going to happen. Will it run? But that 2,200 megawatts cost $30 billion. And that is 15 times more than solar, than utility scale solar. Actually, the math is very easy because I hate math. Solar, utility scale solar is a million dollars a megawatt. So it's easy math which I love. So are you gonna spend, you know, do the math. Are you gonna spend $13 million a megawatt on the Vogel plant? It's like 13 or 14 or 15, or do you wanna spend a million dollars a megawatt on solar? This, this Vogel plant is gonna really affect Southern company because, because the, the, the nuclear debacle in South Carolina was so bad that SCANA, which is owned by the state, it's a very unusual uh, utility. Basically all the people who ran it got kicked out and a whole new group of people came in and the legislature also kicked out all the regulators. And I remember meeting a lot of those regulators over the years at different conferences. And South Carolina had this odd system where it had the same regulators for like, some of those regulators were literally there for 15 and 20 years. Any other questions there, June or Sally? I'm not seeing any, a lot of thank yous. Well, very good. Well, I'm so happy to see these faces now finally here. You know, hello, Anne, and you know, a lot of these brilliant people out here that are, you know, really no energy policy, energy stuff. And so nice to see everybody. And, and thank you so very much for your time and your attention. And again, don't hesitate to reach out to me, uh, there's my email and you can find me easily or on LinkedIn. Uh, any young people that are looking for uh, help, looking for work, there's a lot of work out there right now in the, in the energy area. So anyway, and, uh, and Jennifer Roberts, thank you for that uh, key term I needed, which is uh, coastal- um, Continental shelf. Continental <laughs> shelf, thank you. <laughs> all right. Great job, great job, Nancy. All right, thank you all so much.